Today, I'm going to be giving, uh, mostly giving a, a, a brief introduction to uh, the classical theory of moonshine uh, with some history. So the story of moonshine starts back in the early 1970s. Uh, so 1973 or 1974, Og uh, was studying the, uh, the genus of the of the modular curve, uh, x naught of p plus, uh, and this is the the orbifold. If you take the upper half plane, and then you mod out by uh, the action of uh, the group gamma naught of p, uh, and actually we'll we'll mod out by the normalizer of gamma naught of p inside SL two r. And so Og was studying the genus of this curve, and what he found was that uh, uh, was that this has genus zero if and only if p is in a specific list of primes. So two, three. 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, uh, where am I at? 19, 23, 29, 31, 41, 47, 59, or 71. Okay. So, uh, Og had worked this out in uh, 74. Uh, in January of 1975, uh, he was at a conference in Paris. Uh, around this time, uh, many algebraists were working to classify the, the finite simple groups. And uh, uh, <clears throat> in 1973, Fisher and Grice had independently conjectured the existence of the monster group, so the largest of the uh, sporadic simple groups. Uh, they conjectured it as a, uh, a group containing a double cover of the baby monster. Um, <clears throat> but they, they conjectured the existence of this group, and then at this conference in 1975, uh, uh, Jacques Tits uh, presented, he had worked out the order of the monster group. So he had worked out that the order of the monster group is given by this number, 2 to the 46 times 3 to the 20th times 5 to the 9 times 7 to the 6 times 11 squared uh, times uh, 13 cubed times 17 times 19 times 23, times 29, times 31, times 41, times 47, times 59, times 71. Okay. So he saw that the order of this, of this group and was very fascinated by this because he noticed that the list of primes inside this factorization were exactly the list of primes they give the genus zero, uh, the genus zero modular curves here. Okay, and so uh, Og offered. Uh, so he found he, he found this this association very very interesting, and he offered uh, a bottle of Jack Daniel's whiskey to anyone that could explain it. Okay, so that's, that's the first hint of, of moonshine, of, of what would become monstrous moonshine. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> moving on a little bit as, as uh, the understanding of what this monster group was as, as that uh, continued to grow. In 1978, uh, 
Well, just before this, um, Conway, uh, Conway, Norton, and Grice had independently conjectured the existence of an irreducible representation for the monster of order 196883. And based on that, uh, Fisher, uh, Livingstone, and Thorne uh, worked out the character table for the representation for the monster based on these conjectures. The monster still had not been constructed or even proved to exist, but based on the conjectures, they worked out the uh, character table. Worked out the character table. And uh, what they worked out, uh, the, first, the first few dimensions of the irreducible representation, so the first few values of the character table evaluated at the identity are uh, uh, given as follows. So the first one is just the trivial representation. The second one would be the representation conjectured by uh, uh, Grice and Conway and Norton, which is uh, dimension 196883. Uh, and then there's 194 of these. The largest of these, uh, it's very large. This is about uh, 2.58 times 10 to the 26th. Okay, so the largest irreducible representation is very large for the monster group. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> great. Um, so, while Fisher, Livingstone, and Thorne were working out this table, while they were working out these, these conjectures, uh, John Mackay was working with Conway, and he made an observation about some of these characters. <clears throat> so, Uh, the first observation that he made was 196883 uh, plus 1 is equal to 196884. Uh, and Conway was very surprised by this observation and called this moonshine. Uh, Thompson made a, 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 another generalization of this observation. He, he observed that uh, 1 plus 1, 9, 6, 8, 8, 3 plus 2, 1, 2, 9, 6, 8, 7, 6 is equal to uh, <clears throat> 2, 1, 4, 9, 8, 3, 7, 6, 0, and a few others, a few other similar observations. Uh, the reason that Conway thought that this was an interesting observation here uh, is because here on the left, okay, of course, these are dimensions of ir the irreducible representations of the monster. These numbers here on the right, uh, these are coefficients, uh, 4A coefficients of the modular uh, of Klein's J function. Okay. So this is what uh, Conway thought was uh, so fascinating, so preposterous that he called this moonshine. Uh, that there would be this connection between uh, this modular function and these dimensions of the of the uh, monster group, of the irreducible representations of the monster group. <coughs> so the J function, uh, <coughs> I maybe will speak a little bit more about this later, but the J function, J of tau, has a Fourier expansion. Uh, given by q to the minus 1 plus 744 plus 196884 q etc here q 
is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. Okay, and j is a modular function. Uh, it satisfies a very nice transformation property. j of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is equal to j of tau uh, for any uh, matrix a, b, c, d uh, integer matrix with determinant one. Uh, SL2 z, okay. Uh, in fact, J of tau is called a, a Hout module for SL2Z, so that means that it has, so it's, it's modular, it has this, this nice transformation for any matrix in SL2Z, uh, and it generates the set of functions that have uh, this property. Okay. Uh, and so it's a, it's, it's a very interesting function, a very important function. Uh, and so this was... Uh, a very noteworthy connection between this theory of modular functions and the representation theory for the monster. Okay. <clears throat> so, based on these observations, uh, so Mackay's observations and uh, the generalizations that, that Thompson that Thompson made of this. Uh, Thompson made a conjecture. Uh, okay, so Thompson conjectured uh, that there should exist a naturally uh, a naturally defined representation for the monster uh, so uh, should be infinite dimensional uh, uh, but graded um, Uh, representation for the monster uh, with the following property. So, so, uh, so he called this V natural uh, with the grading V natural n, so that uh, the dimension of the graded components are equal to uh, the coefficients of the J function. Uh, Let me just define C of n like this. So the C of n are the uh, coefficients of the J function. <clears throat> so uh, Thompson, Thompson was suggesting that there should exist something that should occur somehow naturally in mathematics uh, that should have this structure, the dimension of, the, uh, of these individual components for this uh, uh, M module should be given by <clears throat> the coefficients for the J function. And then he suggested uh, that maybe there, there might be a way to get other functions, maybe something similar to the J function, if uh, we did something a little bit different with this, uh, with this module. Uh, so he, yes, so N is from negative 1 to infinity. Uh, we can ignore the n equals zero component. That component doesn't really matter here. We can just define that to be zero. But yes, from negative one to infinity. Uh, uh, yes, vn, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, Thompson defined, so based on his conjecture that this, uh, uh, this moonshine module should exist somehow naturally in mathematics, he defined uh, a series that he called the Mackay-Thompson series. Okay, uh, these are 
functions t sub g, uh, where g is an element of the monster group, uh, defined to equal, so we'll take the sum of uh, the trace of the graded components uh, at the element g times q to the n. Okay? So we get a, a q series where the coefficients are given by the trace of the uh, representation at, at the element g. Okay? And uh, here, of course, because of our uh, definition of, uh, of the, the grading here, uh, the identity element then should just simply give us the j function, or, well, the j function minus the constant term. Okay. And uh, Thompson wanted to know these other functions, if you change g with, so instead of just the identity element, but another element of the monster group, do you get something interesting? Is this, is this a function that's uh, interesting to look at, or is it just a nonsense, arbitrary thing? Uh, so he, uh, he actually worked out a few, uh, a few examples of this using the character table uh, that Fisher, Livingstone, and Thorne had, uh, had worked out, and using the, the observations that they had about the J function. Uh, and he did notice that these, uh, these coefficients look like they were, so, so the functions look like they were uh, interesting functions. They look like they were uh, other modular functions similar to the J function. Okay. Uh, Conway and Norton made this precise. Okay, and this, uh, this is what uh, is known as the monstrous moonshine conjecture. So they conjectured uh, <clears throat> that for each element of the mo uh, of the monster group. Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, an explicitly given group uh, gamma sub g, uh, which is a subgroup of SL2R. Okay. Um, such that uh, the Mackay thompson series T sub G is a Haupt module for gamma sub G. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what this is saying is there's there's some other uh, some other matrix group, okay. So if we swap out SL2Z with one of these other matrix matrix groups, uh, then TG uh, is a, a generator for the uh, um, <clears throat> for the function field of modular functions uh, that are modular on on gamma sub G. Um, <clears throat> So uh, let me explain just a little better what a, what a help module is. So um, for a help module to exist, okay, for, uh, for this gamma sub G here, uh, let's, so we need gamma to be uh, uh, a discrete subgroup of SL2R, and we also need that it should contain uh, this matrix. 
so 1101. So this is important because uh, that means then that the, the Morbius transformation by this matrix is, is uh, just a translation. So this means that we can create a, a Fourier series for, for a function that's modular on this. Okay. Um, then... <coughs> Okay, then, like I said, the Haupt module uh, is a uh, is any function that generates uh, uh, the set of modular functions for, for gamma. Uh, set of functions uh, with the property, so f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is equal to f of tau uh, for any matrix a, b, c, d uh, contained in gamma. Okay, so that's what that's what a helped module is here. Uh, <clears throat> the groups that Conway and Norton described for gamma sub g uh, are fairly simple groups. So in each case, we have the following property. So gamma sub g is contained or it contains the group gamma naught of n uh, here n is the order of the element g inside of the monster group so it's going to contain gamma naught of n and it's going to be contained in the normalizer for gamma naught of n within SL2R In each case, it's it's somewhere it lies somewhere in between those two subgroups. Okay. So, the the set of functions. Uh, so this should generate, I'm sorry, this should generate the field of functions. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> each one of these functions has a pole somewhere, okay, and so we can, we can create a set of functions that have any particular divisor that we want. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> This is the, the normalizer of gamma naught of n within SL2R. Okay. So, uh, the definition I've given for a Haupt module is not necessarily unique, but it will be unique up to um, well, let's see. Uh, it'll be unique up to the location of the pole and then also a constant term. Okay. Uh, when, when they say the helped module, we're going to assume that the pole is, is at infinity. Okay, so, so then, uh, yes? So it, it should generate on... <clears throat> So the function uh, creates, so, so, so our helped module then, um, let's call our helped module H. This is going to uh, take the modular curve, so H mod, uh, the upper half plane mod the group gamma, and it's going to uh, create a bijection 
with the complex numbers. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, so any uh, <clears throat> so any any modular uh, function here we can we can uh, create it as as a rational function in in H. Okay, uh, then we want to uh, to make this to make this a little bit unique. We're going to uh, uh, ask for a particular Q expansion for this. So I want it to look like Q to the minus one plus big O of Q. So this means that the pole is now located at the cusp infinity and then no constant term. Okay, and then this, with this definition, I've made the, the Haupt module unique. Okay. And those, those Haupt modules for the groups gamma sub g are what Conway and Norton are looking at uh, in their uh, theory of monstrous moonshine. This is only defined if the, the upper half plane mod gamma has a compact application, which is genus zero. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, <clears throat> In Conway and Norton's paper, where they where they write this out, they actually show that of um, they actually describe all of the groups uh, with the, with this particular property that R gene is zero, and they show that all but three of them are involved in in this theory. Uh, there's there's three that they call the ghosts that. Uh, uh, don't show up in monstrous moonshine, and then they have a, a few other criteria that uh, could cut out those those three. But yeah. You mean there are three genus zero groups that do not appear in the monstrous? Yes. Yes. Other than that, all of the other genus zero groups of this of this form appear in monstrous moonshine. Okay. Okay, so let's see. That was okay. So that was that was monstrous moonshine. So that was all conjectured. Again, the monster group had not even been constructed at this point, even proven to uh, to exist when uh, Conway and Norton uh, put forward that conjecture in 1982. The monster was finally constructed. Uh, Okay, this was constructed by uh, uh, by Grice. Uh, he constructed it by hand as an automorphism of a commutative but non-associative algebra of dimension one nine six eight eight four. So this was a very difficult, detailed construction uh, that Grice gave for the monster group. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so that happened in 1982. The same year, uh, three mathematicians, uh, Atkin, Fong, and Smith, they verify monstrous moonshine. Uh, and so what that means is they showed kind of computationally that there existed uh, there existed a, a an infinite dimensional uh, graded n module. Okay, let's call this V natural tilde. Okay. that satisfied monstrous moonshine. However, they couldn't uh, cut out the possibility that uh, this was a virtual representation. Okay, so, so the difference of, of, of two uh, legitimate representations. Uh, also, they couldn't 
uh, this didn't really satisfy Thompson's conjecture because this wasn't a natural construction. This, this basically just came, if you assumed monstrous moonshine, um, or, uh, yeah, you could, you could then create this, this, uh, this module and then show that uh, the dimensions here are, are integral. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what I mean when I say that they, they verified monstrous moonshine uh, computationally. So, uh, in 1984, this was a little bit better. Uh, uh, Frankel, Lepowski, and Merman, uh, they constructed, uh, so they found a much more natural construction uh, for um, uh, a candidate for V natural. So I'm going to call this V hat natural. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this one came, they, they constructed this using uh, vertex operators. So this was a much more, much more natural construction. Uh, they were able to show that the graded components uh, had dimension given by the coefficients of the J function. So this satisfied Thompson's conjecture. Uh, however, the theory was not strong enough to show that this was the same module is the one that gave the rest of monstrous moonshine. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So these, these vertex operators that they used to construct their candidate for V natural, these had appeared in physics uh, as early as the 1960s. Um, this construction actually led to a much simpler construction for the monster group itself, much simpler than Grice's original construction, um, <clears throat> or a m much more natural construction. Uh, but uh, a few years later, in 1992, Borchardt's, uh, 1992, so Borchardt's had worked to uh, extend the theory of vertex operators uh, this extended theory of vertex operators uh, to get uh, a more axiomatic formalization of vertex operator uh, vertex operator algebras vertex operator algebras. And this theory was strong enough, okay, applying down here to, uh, uh, to Frank Lepowski Merman's construction, to show that uh, this, this v-hat that they had constructed here, v-hat natural, uh, would satisfy the conditions for uh, Monstrous moonshine. Okay. So he was able to show more than just that the graded dimensions gave the, the uh, coefficients of the J function, but the, the traces at the other elements of the monster group would give the other Mackay Thompson series. What's the difference? Can you verify that Yeah. So their construction for for V natural uh, is not um, not natural at all. It just came from from the modular functions that Conway and Norton had had suggested. Uh, Frankel, Lepowski, and Merman were able to give a natural construction for V natural but they couldn't show that these were the same. They couldn't show that the traces gave the other modular functions, the other Haupt modules. 
Borchards was able to pull these together and to show the full, uh, to prove the full conjecture. Uh, what was that? Uh huh. So they didn't. Uh, they didn't construct the monster group, but this. Uh, this, this theory of vertex operators and, and the particular representation that they, ca that they gave, uh, um, I think it was, was it Mackay? No, it wasn't Mackay. Another mathematician used this, used this construction to give a, a simpler construction of the monster group. Yeah. Okay. So... So 1992, Borchard's, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so 1992, Borchard's proved monstrous moonshine, uh, uh, and he was eventually awarded the, the Fields Medal. Uh, the citation was uh, primarily for, for this proof of monstrous moonshine. Um, John Ogg offered him the bottle of Jack Daniels, but... Uh, he turned it down because he doesn't drink. Uh, <laughs> so the bottle of Jack Daniels has not been claimed. Um, but uh, yeah, Borchards was, was very thrilled when, it, when he proved this. He said that he was over the moon that he had proved monstrous moonshine. Uh, his, <clears throat> so Conway, uh, who was Borchards' advisor, uh, he really liked Borchard's work here, Borchard's proof, but he was never very satisfied that this was actually uh, a proof or, or you know, uh, the, the full story of Monstrous Moonshine. So Conway, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to him a little bit, a little bit ago about this. Uh, he still feels that um, <clears throat> Borchard's proof is still kind of on the level of a verification. Um, it still doesn't give a very deep explanation about why monstrous moonshine is there. It's just kind of a statement, yes, it, it satisfies all of these properties. But it doesn't give any, any real understanding of why there should be this deep connection between the representation theory, the vertex operators, vertex operator algebras, and the modular, uh, the modular functions. Okay. And so that's, that's still kind of an open, uh, an open question. Uh, So moonshine, again, I mean, there's there's been lots of developments with this, even since 1992, even since the proof. Uh, there's been a lot of work trying to understand moonshine. Uh, <clears throat> the theory of vertex operator algebras that Borchardt's uh, came up with uh, has been connected in physics. Okay, uh, has been uh, connected to uh, what are called chiral halves of uh, two-dimensional uh, conformal field theories. Um, and then in 1998, this is this is this is of note because in 1998, Malcedona, uh, a physicist, uh, gave evidence that. Uh, a 2D conformal field theory uh, corresponds to a 3D theory of quanta, uh, th a 3D theory of gravity. What's that? Maldacena. Sorry. Yes. Oh. I have it spelled wrong in my notes. 
How is it spelled? Malda Sena. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. So he gave evidence that uh, these two dimensional quantum field theories correspond to uh, theories of gravity in three dimensions. Uh, this paper uh, has become the most cited paper in physics, as I understand it. It has more than 10,000 citations. Um, it's a very, very cited paper. Uh, <clears throat> In 2007, uh, Witten was looking at the vertex operator algebra uh, corresponding to the moonshine module. So, 2007. So, he says that. Mathematically, uh, so here we're talking in a realm of physics, and uh, mostly I'm saying words that I don't understand at that point. So, <clears throat> mathematically, I don't know what this statement means. Yes, yeah, so he gave evidence for that equivalence, um, but I don't know what, what evidence he gave or really what that statement means. I apologize for that. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so in 2007, uh, Witten conjectured uh, that the moonshine module, V natural, uh, is dual to uh, a theory of pure quantum gravity in three dimensions. Okay, so pure quantum gravity here means, uh, <clears throat> well, trying to reconcile the theory of gravity and quantum mechanics is a difficult thing. And so one approach to this is to throw out all of the other fundamental particles. And so we're just looking at a theory of quantum mechanics and gravitons. Okay, um, <clears throat> That's what I understand uh, pure quant quantum gravity to be. And then uh, this doesn't make sense unless there's, you allow for certain black hole states to appear. And so um, <clears throat> here, so, so Witten conjectured that this V natural is, is, uh, is dual to this theory of pure quantum gravity. And in this theory, um, so the moonshine, the moonshine phenomenon uh, uh, gives a spectrum of physical states. So, in particular, uh, the irreducible components of the graded of the graded pieces, a natural sub n, uh, correspond to uh, black hole states. So, with this conjecture, Witten then asked the question, assuming this conjecture is true, uh, are some black hole states more common than others? Okay. 
So translating this back into the mathematics, where I'm a little bit more comfortable, uh, let's see what this, uh, this, this question means. So these individual, the, the, the graded components, V natural N, I can write these as uh, a summation of irreducible components. Okay, so, uh, so I'll have an irreducible component, let's call it chi. Okay, so there's 194 uh, different ir irreducible characters, okay, so corresponding to irreducible components of this module. Uh, and then there'll be some multiplicity. Uh, M sub chi of n. Okay. So then, uh, <clears throat> Witten's question here uh, becomes, what can we understand about these multiplicity values? Okay. So in particular, uh, let's look at let's look at a density delta chi of n, which we'll define as. Uh, m chi of n divided by the summation of the uh, m psi of n. Okay, so we'll we'll look at uh, <clears throat> the ratio of, of of these multiplicities. Okay, and and the question here is: Are these, you know, are these? Uh, <clears throat> well, how are they distributed? Which ones are more common? Which ones are uh, are less common? Uh, this kind of comes back to a question. I remember when I first learned about monstrous moonshine, uh, I remember coming across just some basic statements about this when I was, was an undergraduate. I remember uh, learning about the J function and that the coefficients of the J function could be written as summations of these uh, dimensions of these, you know, the, the dimensions of the, of the irreducible characters of the monster. And I thought that this was really interesting. Here you've got certain very interesting numbers that you can write as linear combinations of other interesting numbers. And then I realized that this set of other interesting numbers includes the number one, and I realized that most numbers can be written as a linear combination of the number one. Uh, and so I was, I, I was a little bit curious about, okay, if there's, if there's a lot of ones in here, maybe in some sense this is less interesting, okay? I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, <clears throat> But this is this is the the question that we're asking. Are there lots of ones? Are there very few ones? Are there lots of these other different representations? Yes. Uh, so I'm I'm going to look at the multiplicity for a specific irreducible uh, component uh, divided by the summation of all of the multiplicities. Oh. There are there are a hundred sorry there are hundred ninety four different irreducible uh, components. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have written the one ninety four there, but this is a summation of the one hundred ninety four irreducible components, a component times the multiplicity value. So, will you formulate this question? Do yeah. You mean that each irreducible representation of the monster corresponds to one black hole? To a black hole state, yeah. Yeah. Does it mean that there are 194 black hole states? Uh, yes, that's what I understand uh, the conjecture says, yes. Yeah. So there's 194 different black hole states, and then Witten's question is, is what's more common or less common? So 194 is a number of individual representation of mass of Yes. And then what is the denominator, M plus high N? So this is, so I, I'm going to fix an n, and then I'm going to look at the multiplicity value for a specific irreducible representation divided by the summation over all of the irreducible representations. Okay, great. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, have a theorem here. Okay. 
Uh, and this is uh, John Duncan, myself, and uh, my advisor, Ken Ono. Okay, so we, we're looking at this, this question, and we give an answer for this. Uh, so the first thing that we did is we found an asymptotic formula for the multiplicity values. So m chi of n is asymptotic to the dimension of chi divided by the square root of 2 n to the 3 fourths order of the monster group times e to the 4 pi root n. Okay, So we found this asymptotic formula for uh, the multiplicities, and then this gives a nice corollary about the distribution. You'll notice that the only part of this asymptotic that depends on the character itself is, is here in the numerator. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> what we have here is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this delta chi of n is now equal to uh, <clears throat> the dimension of chi divided by the summation of the dimension of the irreducible components. Okay. So this, this denominator here, uh, this is going to be a fixed number. Um, the denominator is uh, about 5.84 times 10 to the 27. Okay. And so, uh, so key in yeah, so, so the irreducible representations, the 194 irreducible representations. Yeah, so we're just summing their, those dimensions. Yeah, so that's, that's always going to be a fixed number about 5.84 times 10 to the 27th. So in particular, uh, <coughs> uh, the density for the trivial representation uh, is going to approach this number uh, one point um, where I'm at one point seven one one times ten to the minus twenty eight. Okay, so the black hole states corresponding to the trivial representation are incredibly rare. Um, <clears throat> this ratio here is uh, it's about the same as the ratio of the mass of a paper clip compared to the mass of the whole Earth. Okay, so incredibly rare. The, the mass of a paper clip compared to the mass of the whole Earth. Yeah, yeah. So these black hole states are incredibly rare. Uh, the larger ones, so the largest, uh, so one, 194, this is going to approach uh, 0 0.044. Okay, so about 4% of those black hole states correspond to the largest representation. Delta 1n is the inverse of this one, right? The 5.84 times. Yes, yes, the inverse of that. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh, <coughs> I will give a very, very short outline of how this proof goes, just the basics. Uh, this theorem is not all that hard. I think it's, I like this theorem a lot. I think it's a very, very pretty theorem. Uh, but it's not, it's not all that hard using the uh, uh, tools of, of modular forms. Uh, and this is, this is one thing that I very much like about this theorem. Uh, I've talked about this theorem to, uh, <coughs> to many other people interested in moonshine, and it's, it's always interesting 
uh, the representation theorists uh, think that this is a very beautiful theorem. And uh, so uh, James Lepowski uh, said that he, he likes this a lot. He doesn't have a clue how to prove this, anything like this, from the representation theory side. From the modular form side, it becomes fairly simple. And so I, I think that this is a very nice example of how the connection to modular forms allows us to prove something interesting about the theory of monstrous moonshine. So <clears throat> the, first, um, the first step uh, uh, in the proof uh, requires you know, just this very basic fact about the orthogonality of characters. Okay, so um, so uh, suppose chi and psi are irreducible uh, characters. Then we have this inner product chi psi, uh, which we can find as one over the size of the group times the summation over elements of the group times the conjugate chi of g times psi of g. Okay? And if these are irreducible, then we get this very nice uh, answer for this. It's going to be 1 or 0 depending on whether or not psi and chi are equal. Okay. <coughs> so, Monstrous Moonshine tells us, so the, uh, the Mackay-Thompson series, Tg, these are equal to uh, sum over n of um, And then in here we have a summation over the over the characters. We have the multiplicity times uh, psi of g times q of n. Okay. So this is this is what monstrous moonshine tells us. Uh, then if I define a function t chi. So this is kind of a twisted Mackay-Thompson series. So I'll define this in this way. Uh, I'll define this as 1 over the order of the monster group times the summation of elements of the monster group uh, chi bar of g tg. Okay. So now Combining these two statements here, what I end up getting then is that this is now equal to a sum of just the multiplicity value for chi times qn. Okay. So each of these multiplicities are themselves a, uh, a coefficient of a modular function. The next thing that we need, uh, and I will conclude this, this very quickly, uh, but the next thing that we need is that we have exact formulas uh, for, the, uh, for the coefficients of the, of the Mackay-Thompson series. So, So let me let me call these C G of n so that I've got T G is equal to this summation of C G of n times Q to the n. Okay. So we have exact formulas for these, uh, but really all I need is is the asymptotic formulas. Uh, the C G of n is asymptotic to uh, well. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to be a little bit imprecise here. Let me just give a big, big O notation. I know that they're bounded at least by some constant times e to the 4 pi square root of n divided by 
big N where uh, big N is the order of the element inside the monster group. Okay. So here in particular, you'll see that the CG of N Uh, the, the CG of N are going to be, uh, the, the largest of these is going to occur when N is 1, corresponding to the identity element, okay, or corresponding to the coefficients of the J function. Okay. So here, when we look at these coefficients here, these, these formulas here, we see that this multiplicity value will be dominated by uh, the coefficient of the J function. We'll get that the multiplicity M chi of N will be asymptotic to the dimension of the character times the coefficient of the J function. Okay. And so that is what gives us the asymptotics uh, that we needed for the theorem as I stated it. Okay, so uh, that's the basic outline for this proof. Um, the details about these formulas here, so this big O notation, we actually have exact formulas for these coefficients, but details for that, uh, that's something that I'll talk about in my lecture tomorrow. Uh, so uh, let me conclude there for today, and, and thank you. <laughs>